The House will come to order. Will the members and our guests please take their seats? So the order of show here is introductions, and then uh, each, uh, each individual, the Chief Justice in this case, writes their own uh, script based on prior years. There will be a number of introductions while you are applauding for the Chief Justice and her entourage uh, as they come in. So I may wait a moment for that so your uproarious applause might just take a little bit, uh, a little bit softer, and then we'll introduce the, uh, both the uh, justices of the Supreme Court and the members of the Court of Appeals. Uh, we're pleased and honored uh, to have with us many guests today. First and foremost, the governor of the state of Indiana, Governor Eric Holcomb. Governor Holcomb. Congratulations on a remarkable job last evening. A former member of this body, the, in fact, the only person I knew that really used to talk tough about the Senate and now pre presides over it on occasion, uh, the 52nd Lieutenant Governor of the State of Indiana, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. The leaders of the Senate, uh, President Pro Tempore Roderick Bray and Minority Floor Leader Tim Lannon. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. And our House leaders here, the Minority Leader Phil Giaquina and the Majority Leader Matt Lehman. Thank you, gentlemen. We have a three of our elected statewide office holders with us uh, in the balcony. Attorney General Curtis Hill, Auditor Tara Klutz, and Superintendent of Public Instruction Jennifer McCormick. Thank you for being with us. I'm going to introduce uh, family members of uh, the Supreme Court justices, hopefully uh, together here. Uh, the uh, spouse of the Chief Justice, Jim Rush, and their, their daughter, Sarah, I'm sorry, daughter, Sarah, and son, Luke Rush, are with us. Thank you. We also have with us uh, the Chief Justice's sister, Helene Bishop. Helene, thank you for being here. Uh, we have the uh, wife of Justice Slaughter, Julie Ann Slaughter. Thank you, Mrs. Slaughter, for being with us. And the spouse of Justice Goff, Raquel Goff, and children, I presume, Ava Elena and Isabel Goff. Thank you. We have uh, the uh, Judicial Administration Chief Administrative Officer, Justin Forkner. Mr. Forkner, thank you. We have three former justices of the Supreme Court with us, Myra Selby, Brent Dixon, and former Chief Justice Randall Shepard. We have a record number of trial court judges with us. Thankfully, I've not been given your names. So I'm going to ask you to all rise and be recognized together. <laughs> you truly keep the wheels of justice uh, turning in our communities, and we thank you for your service. I'm going to break script here, and I'm going to announce those who will be, uh, will be escorting the Chief Justice in, because you won't hear me say their names otherwise. So the Chief Justice is being escorted by the following legislative members, Senator Eric Cook, Senator Aaron Freeman, Senator Greg Taylor, Senator Lonnie Randolph, Representatives Jerry Tor, Representative Wendy McNamara, Representative Lisa Beck, and Representative Reagan Hatcher. The Chief Justice will be joined by her colleagues on the Supreme Court, Justice Stephen David, Justice Mark Massa, Justice Jeffrey Slaughter, and Justice Gr Christopher Goff. And then the members of the Court of Appeals that are with us today are uh, Judges Elizabeth Tavadas, Robert Alt Altice, Rudy Pyle, Elaine Brown, Cale Bradford, Terry Crone, Paul Mathias, Melissa May, 
James Kirsch, Patricia Riley, Edward Najem, John Baker, and Chief Judge Nancy Vadick. Let's welcome the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. This is the longest walk in political. All right, I'm going to put this here. Be careful. I think we're going to be able to do it well otherwise. So I'll stand on it for a moment, introduce you. You step up, okay? Don't trip. I know. longest walk in political life. I just feel like you might have done for me right now. <laughs> Jonathan, take a picture. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce the 52nd Lieutenant Governor of the State of Indiana, Suzanne Crouch. Thank you. Members of the Joint Assembly, Pursuant to Section 3 of Article 7 of the Constitution of the State of Indiana, this joint session of the two houses of the Indiana General Assembly is now convened for the purpose of hearing a message from the Chief Justice of Indiana. It is my privilege to present to you the distinguished Chief Justice of Indiana, the Honorable Loretta Rush. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the 2019 State of the Judiciary. You just saw photographs of judges 
from six, all 92 counties standing in front of their courthouses, and what a view. Those magnificent structures were proudly built in the center of our communities, open to those seeking justice. Each day, our 600 judges serve as problem solvers, carefully listening to the millions of people that walk through those doors. The 1.3 million cases filed in Indian last year are not anonymous case numbers. They're our neighbors, our employers, people we see at the ballpark, church, the grocery store. We are fortunate in Indiana to have legislative leaders and a governor who understand what happens in our courts, who share our commitment to solving the problems that bring people to court, and who work with us in a spirit of mutual respect. Today, I speak for your Hoosier judges and lawyers to affirm that the state of your judiciary is sound, steady, and strong. Our mission is to protect individual rights and liberties, to impartially apply the laws of our state and nation, to remain free from the pull of political influence, and to, to provide a neutral forum for the peaceful resolution of disputes. This requires an independent judiciary, one that continually refines and adapts itself to meet the evolving needs of our customers. Yes, I said customers. It's not common for us to call court users customers. Justice is not for sale, and we don't have a product that can be changed to satisfy the needs of every person. But what we do have is a constitutional charge to provide open, accessible, and fair courts. And that is achieved only when we place everyone, litigants, victims, witnesses, jurors, all court customers in the center of every equation, just as those courthouses you just looked at are at the center of every community. A quarter of a century ago, at this very podium, Chief, then Chief Justice Shepard stood. He pledged to make the judiciary cheaper, faster, simpler. He boldly proclaimed that the courts, for the first time ever, would accept paperwork via fax machine. <laughs> That, <laughs> that decision laid the foundation for today's electronic filing, which accepts over half a million electronic documents each month. He dared to proclaim that we would have a network of volunteer lawyers giving birth to our modern Coalition for Court Access. And when he told you we would do more to help the children of divorcing parents, who could have known how crucial that framework would be to help children who face issues far deeper than a split household? We've stuck with that faster, simpler, cheaper mantra because it allows us to concentrate on customer-focused service. Thank you, Chief Justice Shepard, for yet again leading the way. Could you stand? <laughs> It's a sad truth that substance abuse and addiction have invaded every Indiana community. Last year when we talked about the opioid crisis, we pledged judicial branch action to attack this public health, this public health epidemic. And we all agreed that none of us could solve this extraordinarily complicated issue alone. So what did we do? We partnered with the Indiana Family and Social Service Administration, Indiana University Grand Challenge, and the Association of Indiana Counties to host an opioid summit. We asked judges to convene their own county team for training. Because from that 911 call to arrest, to court, to relapse, to getting someone back on their feet, a person struggling with addiction interacts with a multitude of our justice professionals. With all 92 counties in attendance, a thousand of us rolled up our sleeves, and as only Hoosiers can, we got to work. Our first speaker of the day, Bill Nelson, shared a devastating 911 call that he and his wife, Christy, made when they found their son had died of an opioid overdose. Their willingness to open up about such a story 
help define the day. Their tragic narrative not only reminded attendees why we hosted the event, it also exposed that this epidemic has no boundaries. When Bill Nelson introduced himself to the audience, he left out one fact, his title. Marion County Superior Court Judge Bill Nelson takes the bench every day knowing both the pain of losing a loved one to addiction and the hope of a judge trying to keep other families from suffering a loss that he knows only too well. Those 92 community teams with judges, prosecutors, public defenders, probation officers, law enforcement officers, health officials, and local officials brought strong resolve to, jo to join Judge Nelson in this fight. As Wabash County Probation Officer Sarah Lochner said, one of the greatest things from the summit was it sparked action in my community. It was a catalyst for making ideas happen right now. The teams, these teams took hold concrete tools on the science of addiction and which treatments work, models for family recovery courts, how to connect people to care, care jail-based treatment programs, workforce development, and other program opportunities. We also learned how to share data across systems. And we will sustain that momentum this year with trainings and workshops throughout Indiana to continue to bring community-based solutions to this scourge. While the summit began heavy-hearted, it, it ended with the hopeful message of Brandon George. Like Judge Nelson, Brandon too carries a job title. He's the director of the Indian Addictions Issues Coalition. Having taken his own road to recovery, he told the audience what titles he's most proud to hold. Father, husband, son, good person. He explained, I'm proof that recovery is possible and treatment works. Brandon, will you, Judge and Mrs. Nelson, all our summit partners and all those who attended, please stand. Thank you for participating in that. Judges. several other important initiatives dealing with addiction. Less than a year ago, Indiana was proud to have seven family recovery courts across the state. Today, we have 18 of these specialty courts that are certified or in the planning stages. Family recovery courts are imperative to the addictions crisis. They require judges to work with many community partners to create a plan for parents with addiction to work towards safe reunification with their children, thereby preserving their families. Future generations depend on their parents' sobriety because from that sobriety comes safety, love, and stability. Our own Justice Christopher Goff led a family recovery court when he was a trial court judge in Wabash. This is what he says, and I love this. The ceremony is more than the successful completion of a difficult case. It is a celebration of lives reclaimed and the anticipation of positive change for generations to come. Governor Holcomb, thank you for getting behind this initiative. The impact of your support is enormous. Thank you very much. <laughs> Courts are in a unique position to support our most vulnerable customers, our children. And there are many reasons why children and families walk through those courthouse doors. Right now, we have around 135,000 cases involving children, matters like divorce, paternity, delinquency, support, custody, adoption, child welfare, termination of parental rights, and more. In Indiana, over a third of our children live in single-family households, and almost 60,000 grandparents are raising their, their grandchildren. Tragically, Indiana is one of the top states in the country with children whose parents are incarcerated. Last year, Senator Holdman and Superintendent Jennifer McCormick invited to meet with, for me to meet with some educators. When I did, those educators expressed tremendous concern for students that are shuttled from house to house, parent to parent, and the impact that has on a child's education and well-being. Judges share those concerns, and we have some effective tools that we're doing to, place, to work on those challenges. Let's talk about just a few. This past year, we created the Parenting Time Calendar. 
This is an online application where the Indiana Parenting Time Guidelines work in concert with the Department of Education school calendars, thus providing a conflict-free, predictable schedule through an electronic calendar which will simplify the process for families, our customers. Another online tool we developed is a child support calculator. Would you believe this past year, nearly $1 billion was collected in Indiana through court order child support? Our review, our regular review of the Indiana Child Support Guidelines is underway, led by Fulton County Judge Christopher Lee. As part of the review, the judges and lawyers on the Domestic Relations Committee look at the fundamental needs of children, food, medical, education, clothes, housing, and more. They get information from economists and many other partners to create the guidelines. You know who else they heard from? Parents. Moms and dads in real world situations sent us letters, emails, came to our state house courtroom to explain what they needed from the child support guidelines. Judge Lee delivered the message those customers deserved. He said this, your voice will be heard. Quality customer service depends on reliable information that we get from those judges in those meetings. Thank you, Judge Lee. Could you stand? <laughs> Quality customer service also depends on reliable and useful technology. Courts can no longer close their doors at the end of the day. We provide court access after hours with the ability to pay fines, file cases, issue protective orders, review court documents, and many other services. This means our customers don't have to miss work, leave family, stand in line, pay postage, make copies, all to pay a traffic ticket, file a case, or find out about their court date. Today, 80% of the case load in Indiana is in one central court case management system. And our court customers are taking readily, ready advantage of the free online access. Free online access. More than 6 million visited our Indiana My Case website last year more than 20 million times. The electronic, the electronic filing of court documents has proven to be a game changer for the judicial branch. Over half a million documents are electronically filed each month. In a short time, we've already saved 20 million, 25 million pieces of paper. Chief Justice, thank you for that first fax machine. <laughs> to show how far we've come, in just this last May, we started a program to send messages, text messages, to criminal defendants to remind them of their next court hearing. Simple tool, already used by 40 counties, nearly 350,000 text uh, reminders have been sent both five days before and one day before a person's hearing. The goal here, again, it's simple. We want to reduce the number of people who fail to show up for their court hearing. Fewer failures to appear mean fewer arrest warrants need to be issued, which means fewer individual defendants are rearrested, which means fewer people are sent to our already overcrowded jails. How is that for an inexpensive and effective way to use court technology? While we're talking about safe and effective ways to manage our local jail populations, imagine you're sitting in jail. You're awaiting trial in a criminal case. You haven't been convicted of anything, so you're presumed innocent. The problem is you don't have the money to pay your bond. So even if you are a low-risk, nonviolent offender, you could sit in jail. You may lose your job, your entire family suffers while you await trial, and the taxpayers foot the bill. At the same time, a high-risk offender who has access to cash and bond is back on the street within hours. Why do we keep doing this? In one snapshot last year, 99% of our jails were at capacity. Some counties were 250%. I'm sure you're hearing about this. And over half the statewide jail population is awaiting trial. Last session, we joined forces with you, the legislature, to tackle the interrelated criminal justice issues of pretrial release and bail reform. Make no mistake, like you, community safety remains our number one priority. But keeping nonviolent, non-convicted, presumed innocent community members in jail is counterproductive. The toll it takes is crushing. One vital step in revamping our system is to examine pretrial detention. What happens when a person is arrested? Here's one example. In Monroe County this past year, a 20-year-old man was brought to court for a drug possession charge. His parents were willing to bond him out 
but not by paying money, or they weren't willing to bond him out, because they were afraid that if he bonded out, he would just continue to use. They told Marilyn Dikoff that if, they, if he was out, he would use again. So instead of languishing in jail, the Monroe County pretrial team coordinated his release straight from jail to treatment, giving him a much better chance of recovery and a path to avoid rearrest or overdose. Judge, Judge Dikoff, will you and the members of your team, Prosecutor Erica Oliphant, Chief Public Defender Phyllis Emmerich, and Pretrial Services Supervisor Becca Street, please stand. Thank you. Well done. It is a heavy lift to reform the front end of our criminal justice system. Senators Young, Taylor, Representative McNamara, Representative Stewart, can I have an amen on that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> but we're seeing promising early results. In Monroe County, over 90% of those released made all court appearances and were not rearrested. We already have 31 counties researching, developing, developing and implementing best practices. Our pretrial efforts are joined with the problem-solving courts. By the end of this year, we should have over 110 courts, representing a 40% increase in just the past three years. These courts have a proven track record of reducing recidivism while keeping our citizens safe. We are very proud to say 85% of all of Indiana's problem-solving court participants last year remained arrest-free. We are working hard to close that long-standing revolving door back into the criminal justice system. Thank you. In looking to the needs of our business customers, we are in the third year of a commercial court pilot project. It's no secret, a strong, predictable court system is good for our state's businesses and workforce and in turn good for our economy. That's why we developed the program with the support of the business community. Picture, if you will, a lawsuit with two large corporations at loggerheads over a contractual dispute concerning certain leasing provisions. Millions of dollars are at stake. These businesses need prompt decision and learned guidance from the judge. In truth, there's no need to imagine such a situation because both sides are here today. Because their case is resolved, not bogged down in costly litigation detrimental to both businesses. While the nature of a lawsuit is adversarial, the nature of a business is to get back to work. And after just 143 days, this complicated case is over. Today, these corporations, Simon and Starbucks, are even developing new business ventures together. Marion County Judge Heather Welch, the attorneys on that case, Andy Dethridge and Brian Strawbridge, their clients, and all the commercial court judges are here. Could you all please stand and thank you for being part of the pilot program? At the opposite end of that spectrum is a, a, from that commercial court case are those cases where no lawyer is present and a person is left to navigate the court system on their own even though life-shattering outcomes could be at stake. Again, imagine yourself in court, no access to a lawyer in a case where you could lose your children, you could lose your home, you could lose your livelihood. While no one is above the law, it's equally true that no one is beneath it. According to a recent survey, more than 70% of low-income households have been involved in an eviction case, an employment dispute, or another civil legal matter in the past year. In 80% of those cases, they lack legal counsel. Justice only for those customers who can afford it is not justice for all. In fact, it's not justice at all. To address this vital need of fundamental fairness, we created the Coalition for Court Access, made up of 20 legal stakeholders who provide a focused and comprehensive organizational structure for Indiana's civil legal aid programs. I want to take a moment to thank the 7,780 Hoosier attorneys and the hundreds of law students who last year donate, donated over a half a million hours of volunteer legal services for those of limited means.
Each year, the legislature appropriates $1.5 million for basic legal services, and we're asking to increase that to $2 million. There is a remarkable return on investment. An Indiana economic impact study showed that for every $1 invested in legal aid, nearly $7 goes back into the economy. Legal aid helps court customers be productive. And I want to illustrate the good that comes from bringing civil legal aid to Hoosiers, and let me tell you about Francie. Francie is in her 70s. She has an independent spirit, and she's worked hard to meet her own needs. But some health issues crept in, and she was cited for ordinance violations that she wasn't able to resolve on her own. Francie was in very real danger of losing her home. Fortunately, Lori Goggins, an, an attorney with the Indianapolis Legal Aid Society, received a referral from the Marion County Department of Health, and she represented Francie in numerous court hearings. Today, Francie is in her home. Having a lawyer represent her made all the difference. Your Hoosier judiciary is committed to closing the justice gap for customers like Francie, and we are tremendously grateful for your support. Francie, would you mind getting up and introducing your attorney, Lori? <laughs> our judges care so deeply for the people they serve, those customers at the center of our judicial system. When a person walks into their county courthouse, they are often facing the toughest day of their life. And you know who they'll face on that bench? People like Bill Nelson, who has faced his own tough times. Chris Lee, who is pledging to listen. Marilyn Dekoff, who made sure someone's son got to treatment. You saw their pictures at the beginning of this address, and many of them are here today. Will all of our judges please stand? There is no one I'd rather see standing in the center of our communities than you, our judges, because I know that means that our customers are at the center of everything we do. Thank you, and may God continue to bless our great state of Indiana. Thank you. Thank you very much. This joint session is now adjourned. Damn that thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the dirt on that at some point. House come to order. Chair recognized Representative Lehman for a motion. Is there a second? All in favor indicate by voting aye. We're adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I've taken a spill on that thing before. I forget it's there. You know.